Hello, everybody, and welcome to Taking Control, the ADHD podcast on Rash Pixel FM. I'm Pete Wright, and right over there is HR Nikki Kinzer. Hello, everyone. That is oh, human Nikki. resources. Uh, Nikki mm-hmm. Kinzer, in fact, human I have a little professional. Uh, a little thing here that my husband found in the garage when we were cleaning up the mm-hmm. garage that says Nikki Kinzer, PHR. I <sighs> used to be a certified professional human resource. That's right. Right. Person. Part of the SPHR. Yeah. M. SPHRM, the Society of Professional yes. Human Resources Managers. Sure. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was me for a while. Old school. And that means you are putting on your interview tips hat from the perspective of somebody who uh, actually has done a lot of interviewing and has been on the receiving end of so many resumes. True. And, uh, yeah, so we're going to talk all about that today. Uh, very excited about that. Before we dig in, head over to TakeControlADHD.com. Get to know us a little bit better. You can listen to the show right there on the website or subscribe to the mailing list, and we will send you an email each time a new episode is released. You can connect with us on Twitter or Facebook at Take Control ADHD. And did you know that you can join us live each week and hear this podcast super early? All you have to do is visit Patreon.com slash The ADHD Podcast to sign up. For just a few bucks a month, you get access to the live stream of the show, your very own personal podcast feed, and depending on your level of support, monthly workshops with us that go beyond what we cover in the podcast each week. Most important, though, is that by joining us as a patron, you're joining the community of listeners that keeps this podcast thriving. This is an incredible group active every day in our online community on Discord and Facebook, and they are an incredible gift to us. So drop a few bucks in the jar and help us guarantee that we continue to grow the show, add new features, and invest more heavily in our community at patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast. Thank you. Big news today uh, in our community. Today is Discord Mom's birthday. Yay. Happy birthday. Yay. She happy does birthday, Melissa. so much for us on the back end of Discord. So we appreciate you and happy birthday. Absolutely. Everybody give her a shout out and some sort of an animated gift. That's right. Uh, would be really great uh, to Melissa. Discord Mom uh, on Discord. Okay. We have some news. Women's ADHD Palooza is coming. Yes, we have an announcement. So the the I don't know how many years they've done this now, but it is coming. Uh, it is a great opportunity to listen to many ADHD experts in the field, including you and IP. We're going to be on there. Oh, yeah, we're totally there. Yes. And we're actually going to continue the conversation around the workplace. So um, I'm excited about that. And there will be a link to sign up uh, in the show notes. And it begins February 24th through the 29th. So it's uh, at the end of February. We love what uh, Linda and team are doing over there and then just what a great resource they are in the community. And we're we're happy to be a part of that, too. So. Absolutely. So great. I have a little personal story for you before we get going. Oh, good. So I've been looking for a planner that is kind of like a wellness type of planner, right? For me to kind of be able to journal and track some of the habits that I'm working on. And I've been looking online and I just, I don't know, I haven't really found anything that I liked. And you know that I like the bullet journal, right? I've always said that I like the bullet journal for healthy habits, especially for tracking and stuff. So I decided to go to Barnes & Noble yesterday. and. They had all of the regular bullet journals that are just bullet journals. And then they had these planners. They had no wellness planners, which was just sad. Um, And they just had regular planners. But I found this bullet journal, like planner, you know, like weekly planner, but it's a bullet journal. But it's already got all the bullet parts. Yes. Lined up for you. And it has like, you know, the day and the week and the month. And it has all these like places for notes and everything. And I thought, I'm going to. I'm going to do this. This is going to be my wellness planner where there was one left. I was so excited, but I got shamed for procrastinating. Why? So I go there to pay and he says, um, and I bought some puzzles. I bought two puzzles that were on (laughs) sale (laughs) and this planner and the total came to like 20 something. And I was like, huh? And he goes, well, the planner was 75% off. And I'm like, really? It's 75% off? And he's like, well, yeah, it's almost February. (laughs) (laughs) 
I'm like, thank you for my planner <laughs> that I bought for four dollars and ninety cents. That's a great deal. I know. I'm like, how can you shame me for that? And there's still eleven months in the year, people. I mean, come on. I was like, wow. He was mean. That is a riot. Yeah. So you know, anyway. um, I I'm gonna as long as you're doing that, I. I want to shout out something that came across my radar. It's the Cortex uh, Theme System Journal. And uh, I'll drop a, a link in the show notes. And these these guys uh, are some of my favorite nerds. And uh, uh, CGP Gray and, and Mike Hurley uh, and the Cortex podcast has made uh, over the last several years a great work of themes, yearly themes instead of resolutions. It's very nice. similar to stuff we talk about all along, but they actually have gone so far as to have a, as to create a sort of bespoke journal for the the Cortex, um, you know, theme system. And so in it, it allows you to track all your like high level themes for a given year. What are you doing to work on the theme that you're promising yourself is going to be what you're going to be focusing on for a year? How are you doing it? Are you tracking your habits and new behaviors? I really like what they've done. And it's a very high quality, like um, everything's very, like very high quality paper. And yeah, he, Mike Hurley also runs the, the pen addict podcast. And so he has a deep ingrained sensitivity for high quality paper and pens. So this paper is like the best that they can do, like the balance between, you know, paper and pen and bleed and all of the the wonderful pieces that go into it. So, you know, if you want to explore a different system that uh, that also works, I'll put a link to the Cortex system in there. It's, it's pretty fun. I have not purchased it myself, but I have uh, friends who have and they really like how it works. So that's great. There we go. All right, Nikki Kinzer. Interviewing. Now, this is a continuation of our discussion on uh, ADHD in the workplace. It is a thing that causes uh, uh, anxiety to many who have written, who have said that this is a thing that's important to them, uh, that uh, interviewing, it, it, let's say you get your resume through the door, you get it to the right person, and you get the call for the interview. Uh, boy, does that RSD uh, kick in. Uh, <laughs> right. Early, early and often. So uh, how do you, as a former HR professional, SHRM, member of SHRM, That's right. uh, how do you want to approach this now as a former SHRM, now ADHD coach? <laughs> Oh, that's so funny. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I think it, it definitely there is a lot of RSD around interviewing. And uh, but we did talk about that. We talked about that in the first two shows, you know, about how to handle those emotions and such. And so today's show is going to be really about tips and things to get you ready. And I think that the biggest thing that happens is you get that call. And you're surprised because you're not expecting the call, right? And so um, what I want to talk about is getting ready for the call. We need to expect it and then be ready for it. So one of the things that I suggest is check your voicemail message. How does it sound? Mm -hmm. Is it professional? Oh, I think so many people leave that voice message when they first set up their phone and they forget, they forget like, what right. they did. Yeah. yeah. And when you answer your phone, especially to a number that you don't recognize, make sure you answer it professionally because you don't want to be like, hey, what's up? Or who are you? Like, who is this? You know, right? Like, you got to just be careful that... Well, and can I just say from a technical perspective, many new phones, I think they do this in Android. I know they do this on on uh, Apple. When you set it up, it says, you know, do you want to turn on uh, blocking of anonymous calls? So if they're not in your in oh, your list, right. in your contact list, that they'll just go straight to voicemail. You can turn that on. And some people, you know, you turn that on once, you forget that it's on, and suddenly your phone's not ringing. Oh, that's a and good point. And you're, you get voicemail notifications, but if you're not checking those, then you, you miss calls, you miss texts. Uh, and those things, as far as I know, are still important. As much as, you know, organizations are moving to email, uh, interaction and online hubs for managing resume submissions and things. Those things are still important. So make sure you have those on those settings online. And actually, it's a good point. If you're getting an email, uh, you know, I check your email address. If you are looking for a job and it's uh, something that if you have some weird email address, you might want to like change a, your address to an actual like job hunting address just because you really want to just give your best 
impression, you know, first first impressions are important. So that's something else to kind of think about too. So you know that the person on the call or however you're talking to the person wants to set up an interview. Now, if you're talking to them, you may get all excited and just be like, yeah, yeah, that's great. Let's, you know, set up a time and you give me the time and and that's all. But what I want you to do is actually um, let them know, okay, hold on just a moment. Let me grab my calendar, put them on mute so that you don't, they don't hear you rustling around because we know that's probably what's going to happen is you're, you know, you're not expecting the call. So you want to, go and look for whatever you need as a piece of paper or whatever, but um, put them on mute. Have your calendar ready to go. If it's on your phone and you can't talk at the same time, right? Because it's like, you don't want to put the person on speakerphone. At least have a piece of paper and have an idea of when you can interview. And um, so that you kind of know this going into it. And then when you get back on the phone, um, you want to schedule it, but then confirm with them out loud what the day is, what the time is, and what the address is. So we want to make sure you confirm all of these things and also ask them if there's a, you know, a best, is is there a place that you should park? You know, is there anything you should know about parking? These are all things that for the ADHD mind, you need to be able to hear twice at least and then be able to write it down. So that's why I say that. Well, and and all of these things that Nikki just said, write them down and put them on a checklist. Right, right. right. This is a great opportunity for a checklist to make sure that you are covering all of those every time you talk to a potential uh, hirer. Absolutely. As soon as you get off the phone, you need to put this appointment in your calendar right away. Don't wait. Put it in your calendar. Set a reminder the night before the interview, the morning of the interview, whenever you think is best for you to be helpful. But we don't want to forget the interview and we want to make sure we're going to talk about this, but we want to prepare for it. So just don't don't wait. Just put it in there right away so you know that you won't forget. Uh, Now you have the interview and you're going to get ready for it. So there's this preparation. So the tip number two is really about researching the company and the position that you're hired, um, being hired for or being looked at, I should say. So know who you're talking to, review their website, research them on Google, reread the job description that they have, you know, whether it's on a online platform or whatever. Um, and, you know, as you're doing the research, write down any kind of questions you might have for the company. And we're going to talk about this more in just a minute, but this is important. Just, you know, what what is piquing your curiosity? So just do some research. You don't want to go into a job interview not knowing anything about the company. Well, and I think you just you just said something really important, which is, you know, goes back to, you know, mood, right? We talk about putting yourself in a mood uh, to be curious, right? To to be in a mood where you are provoked by this company that you want to work for, because going in with questions that indicate that you are a, a seeker, right? That you're in a space to explore and to to learn. Uh, it, it sets you apart from a lot of folks who just are oh, it will. looking for another gig. Absolutely. It will definitely set you apart. Uh, so we have been asked before if we're just talking about like those administrative or office type of positions. And I think that these tips really go to any type of position that you're looking for, whether it's entry level, uh, high level, whatever. Um, it really doesn't matter. You got to research the company. You got to, you know, show your best self, all of that stuff. Um, and tip number three is you have to practice interviewing. Um, and this is especially true if you haven't interviewed in a long time, which would be me. <laughs> If I was to go into an interview, I would have to really practice it and role play with someone to even, you know, how do I sound? Uh, So look at some common interview questions. You know, it has been a while since I've been in a position where I've hired people. I would think, though, that the questions are still pretty standard, still pretty much the same. And so think about how you want to answer these questions, role play with someone, record yourself so that you can listen back and really, you know, what do you notice? Are you talking too much? Are you talking too little? Are you saying, um, too much or, uh, uh, right? I just said, uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that kind of stuff. So you can just kind of see uh, what's going on. Think about how you want to explain your past positions. 
what do you want your future to look like? Even if you don't know, have some kind of answer in your mind, right? Of, of where you might want to go. Practice how you will explain why you left your last jobs. I think this question is, is going to be probably asked. So we want to be prepared of how you want to talk about it. We, in the first couple of shows with Dr. Uh, Doug Ayer, we talked about not talking negative about your job or company or past bosses. So be listening to that, how positive you come across, even if it's true, you know, they're never going to know the real story. And so you know the story, they don't. And if you talk negative and and kind of have an edge around you, the only person that's going to look bad is you because they're not going to necessarily believe that this boss was horrendous. And so you just have to be really careful with how you approach yourself. Be positive. Talk about what you learned, what you enjoyed, and what you're looking for in the future and, and move on from it. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. And and I have some thoughts and questions. Sure. Uh, now, I I know things are very dynamic in the hiring process. And, and I know that many organizations have a number of sort of hurdles that you have to cross to get there. I know in my past experiences, you know, you'd come in for the, there, there'd be the initial call. Hey, you know, we're just going to essentially vet you, right? The first call is generally on the phone and it's, it's you know, we want to make sure that you are a real human being, that you really want a job, that you live in the area, that our expectations align with, you know, you and being in this space with this company. And then you get that that we'll call it the first interview. And that may be with an HR manager, right? I mean, that's somebody who is who is again gonna further the process and and make sure that you have a background check done and and that all of the sort of basic kind of operational stuff. But then you get companies that are are doing much more to experience you and create a, a an experience of fit. And that may include examinations. It may include, you know, some sort of tests, logic tests. If you're going into an engineering position, it'll be some sort of mathematics, engineering, science questions, things like that. Like, I, I know that the stories of uh, Microsoft and Google and Apple of of their, uh, you know, rigorous interviewing process is extensive, where people are going back for eight, nine, ten interviews with different hiring managers uh, to make sure that those are are a good fit. Now, when I think about that experience, uh, and even in my last job in in uh, uh, marketing and and public relations, you know, I went through five interviews to to get into the position where I was, and that was in a it was a senior sort of director level position for a, an international company, and so I expected that kind of rigor, but. What it does to the ADHD brain is dizzying, right? When every time you're having to get yourself uh, up to a, a level of readiness for a job that you already sort of have in your head that you've interviewed for. Do you have any thoughts on that, on on how you a approach that as a, as a process? You know, I think that it's one of those things that you just have to sort of take it day by day and not jump to the future, right? Because I, I and and I think that what I'm hearing from you is some anxiety around what that's going to look like. And so right. I would say we need to we need to address that piece and and be okay with whatever that process is and just take it one examination at a time, one interview at a time. Um and uh, keep centering yourself. Uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the actual interview too, of how to kind of calm yourself when you're in the interview. But um, honestly, I would just say, don't try not to worry about all of that. Let's just take it one step at a time and see what happens. I remember interviewing with the whole department before I went into the HR um department at the credit union that I worked with. And I thought that was great because I actually got to see who I was going to be working with. I got to see my boss. I got to see my coworkers. They asked me questions. I asked them questions and we could see if it was going to be a good fit. So I think that, again, I would look at it as an opportunity for you to also be interviewing them and looking at them and and uh, how they fit with with what you're looking for. And the more information you have, the better. <laughs> I think it's also a really great opportunity too to position in your head, maybe not out loud, but in your head as if, okay, let's assume I already have the job. How would I treat my experience working with these people, right? I'm going to meet maybe eight, 10 
different people on this journey of interviewing. How would I like them to see me if I already had the job? How would I like them to see my representation of this work, these tasks that they're asking me to do if I already have the job? I think that can uh, that can go a long way toward reducing that anxiety that you're talking right. about, the things that we can normally that we might normally pick up uh, on the job hunt um, when we're in that process. Okay, so tip number four is those first impressions. And, uh, you know, whatever the whatever you think the dress code is, definitely wear that. But for even more casual jobs, I would say step it up a bit. Doesn't mean you need to wear a suit or anything like that. But, um, you know, if, if the if the job is usually just jeans and a sweatshirt or whatever, I, you know, you can probably still wear jeans, but have a nicer shirt, you know, just step it up a bit on that first impression. You don't want to walk in with sweats or, you know, not being groomed and all of that. First impressions matter. And I'll tell you within most of the time I could tell within probably just a few minutes, that first few minutes, if I was going to take you to the next step or not. I mean, it is really a very quick process. You want to be there around 10 to 15 minutes early in the waiting room and have already checked in. So this is really important um, for ADHD because we know this is not easy. So you really got to plan it out. And uh, I did this with a client recently where she had an interview. We figured out where it was, how long it was going to take her to get there from her house and uh, kind of, you know, thought about the the commute. And we decided to actually get her there earlier, about probably 20 to 25 minutes early. She waited in her car and then went in at 15 minutes early, checked in and and waited for the person. So if you're concerned, get there early, wait in your car and be there. You don't, you, that's a much better um, solution than to be running late. Cannot stress that enough for me too. I, I I am. Uh, I'm definitely. I'm an avid car waiter because uh, I don't want to risk GPS sending me to the wrong place. Right. I don't want to risk like I've. And uh, if if there is a question, you know, so many. Uh, I live in an area where there are hundreds and hundreds of businesses, but they all exist inside of giant sort of warehouse style fronts, right, where you have the little tiny sign on a little tiny door mm -hmm. that's in the middle of a giant building that's full of dozens and dozens other businesses, and you have to wind through to get to just the right building. I always pre-plan the drive. Like if I have a meeting on with them on Wednesday, I'll take the time on Tuesday and drive it, make sure I'm at the the place where I know I'm going to walk in that door so that I can get those questions answered uh, well in advance. Um, because I really stress about uh, locations. I'm just terrible at it. I don't have an intuitive sense of it. I've got to have it mapped out prior. Well, and that's another good example of why we want to double check the location when we're setting up right. the interview, especially if you're interviewing right. somewhere that has more than one location. We want to make sure you get the right one. Right, uh, right. Be very kind to whoever is greeting you, whether it's a receptionist, front person, whoever it is, even if it's a relaxed environment, assume that the person that you're meeting with could be the person that you're interviewing with. So, you know, be friendly, be nice, and give them a nice, firm handshake, people. Look at <laughs> look at them in the eye and say, nice to meet you. And I'm speaking to the women out there, especially because there's so many women that have, you know, kind of nice, you know, little kind of flimsy handshakes. We don't need that. We want a nice, firm handshake. Be confident and, uh, you know, nice to meet you. It matters. It matters, you know, and I think it's just a, a nice, um, also boost your confidence up a little bit too. Like, hey, I can do this, right? So when you're in the interview, please don't lie. <laughs> I know it's really easy to want to embellish maybe what you know or don't know, but this will come back to bite you later if you get the job and they thought you knew something and you don't know it. So it is totally fine. You know, oh, I have some experience with this, but, you know, I probably could learn more. Or I could do some more research on it. Whatever. You can still make it look positive and, and nice, but don't lie about it. You can also, I mean, you, that's a great way to highlight skills, right? Exactly. I'm, I don't know about that, but I'm a quick study and I love to research. And and that is a that is a great way to accentuate something that you're, you're pretty good Absolutely. at. Absolutely. Ho I hope you're good at that. Don't say that if you're not good right. at that. 
<laughs> right. <laughs> it's important. Uh, keep your answers positive. Remember your practice interviewing skills, right? Mm -hmm. um, they will ask probably about your challenges. So again, we want to be honest, but we don't want to... We don't want to express it in an all or nothing way. Like I am bad at this or I never could do this. You know, just be really careful with how you're explaining yourself because, you know, it, it, there is that standard. What are your weaknesses? What are your strengths? And so in case you get that, just be careful on how you portray that. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is great advice that was given to me. And I think I've given it to other people. They can't ask you a question that you don't know because the interview is about you. So if if you don't know how to do something, that's, you know, we've already addressed that. But if they're asking you about yourself and about your experience and about all, you know, what you know and what you're interested in, it's all about you. And just remember that there are no wrong answers. Be yourself and uh, just take a deep breath pause for a second before you respond mm -hmm. and, um, you know, let them know what you want them to know. And it's okay to sell yourself. You know, you don't have to be the, the sleazy car salesman person. But if they ask you why you're the best person for the job, think about how you're going to answer that. You know, how, what is your skill set? What, what would make you an asset? Why would they be lucky to have you? And you can do all of these things when you're in that practice interviewing stage so that you do come across confident. Uh, that's what, exactly what I was going to say. By the time you get into an interview, you will have practiced this question because it's an important one in the interview process. And whether you get asked that question specifically or not, being able to have practiced that language is important. I, I do have a question for you about, you know, and I think for me, it would be the, uh, we'll call it the uh, ADHD uh, uh, chatterbox that I can sort of find myself in. So I'm wondering, and this will allow us, I think, a transition to our next major tip a topic. Like, how do you, uh, you're sitting in a high pressure situation with somebody who has the influence to uh, help sell whether or not you uh, should be working at this place. Uh, how do you uh, say what you need to say and then shut up and not get too enthusiastic about telling your story over their own? You have to practice. Yeah, You have to practice the interviewing. And if you don't have somebody to practice with, I highly recommend you record yourself. Yeah. Because it is so true. I mean, and, and it's something that you don't even realize you're doing. Um, and you have to listen to it for yourself. And then you have to look back and think, okay, I can edit this part. I don't, they don't need to know about this part. And then that way you can kind of edit yourself. Practice. It's all you can do is practice. I, I think there is a uh, you one you want to practice the interview process, but don't forget that every human interaction that you have is an opportunity to practice, right? Not doing this. Yes, well, that's a, an excellent point because it doesn't have to just be an interview; it can be in conversation, a daily conversation. Absolutely. Yes. When you're in the job hunt process, when you're in the interview process, there's no better time than to really focus on, am I saying what I need to say when I need to say it to this person? Am I, most important, am I listening? Am yes. I listening to every single thing that they're saying? Whoever I'm talking to, whether it's a, a barista at Starbucks or the, the person who's interviewing me for a job, am I paying attention to what they're saying or am I paying attention to the next thing that I want to come out of my mouth? Because if it's the latter, you're going to put your foot in it. Uh, and that's that's a really important thing, I think, to to stop and and take a take a step back. But the other piece leads directly into tip six. Do you want to introduce that? I do. But before I do that, I just want people to know, too, that something that I used to do when I interviewed is I would purposely have a pause there. So somebody would answer a question for me and then I would be writing it down and I would I would purposely not say anything. <gasps> Oh, diabolical. Right. Because I knew <laughs> that if I didn't say anything and there was a little bit of pause, that they would say something because people are really uncomfortable with silence. And so and a lot of times that's how you could kind of figure out who this person was, you know, because they would start talking. Now, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but I am telling you that there are interviewers who will do that because that is a trick for the interviewer to learn more about the interviewee. And so either you sit comfortable with silence or and wait for the next question or um, really do think 
before you speak about what you're saying here. Is it really necessary? Right. I, this is this is a an important skill for just you know human conversation is giving giving the person that you're in, in partnership with in that conversation a chance to breathe and a chance to speak and I think one of the things that we have internally is a clock that is that is uh, unintentionally sped up when silence hits and we think that a given silence is much longer than it actually is it's, yeah that's very uh, true it's not very long and and uh, so it, it it will feel awkward to you long before it's actually awkward right Right. Okay. So yes, going into tip number six is ask your own questions. And so when they ask you at the end, you know, do you have any questions? Please have some, because it was always sort of a turnoff to me if somebody said, nope, I don't have any questions because it just, to me felt like, okay, so they're not really that interested. Maybe they don't like me. I was a really hard interviewer. Like I wasn't a hard interviewer, but I was hard to read. And most HR people are hard to read. And I remember people after I hired them, they would come in and they would be like, I just didn't know what you thought. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. and I could have thought they were the best thing since sliced bread, but they couldn't tell. So you do want to make sure you have questions um, and kind of be able to to find out if this is a good fit, because this is really your research. And I think for ADHD, it's really important that you're looking for the right fit, right? We know how hard it is to find the right job and to to find a job that's going to fit you, that you're going to be engaged in. And so it's important that you do the interviewing as well. And I have some I have some examples, some questions. They'll be in the transcripts. We can put them in the show notes too, if you'd like. I'm also going to put this into a blog post. And so it will also be in a blog post um, this week as well. But these are some questions you can ask. Uh, what do you think are the most important skills for someone to have in this position? So in your mind, you're thinking, does it match my skill set? So you're making them not just ask you what you know, but what do they think is most important? What does a typical day look like for this position? And does that sound good to you? Is that how you want to spend, you know, 40 to 50 hours of your life per week? You know, you got to think about that. I would also ask, how might the day vary from day to day or the week? Is there different jobs you'll be doing? Because again, variety, I think, is important for a lot of ADHDers. Creativity is really important. So you want to know, is does this job vary or am I doing, you know, the same thing or whatever? Um, how many people would I be working with and, and how do I work with them? This is specifically important too, whether or not you like teams or you don't like teams. So you want to know, you know, who's going to be around you? Who do I report to? Now, this may you who you're interviewing could be the person you report to. So I don't know. Um, but if it is great, because then you can ask them questions. You know, what do you like about working here? Uh, what are you looking for in an employee? Um, that kind of, you know, kind of thing. Um, this is a little trickier. So I don't. I, when I wrote this down, I thought, gosh, I don't know if I'm saying this right. So Pete, you can kind of tell me what you think. Should I, okay. should I expect a lot of overtime or are there certain times of the year that are busier than others? I think that maybe what I would say now that I look at it is don't maybe, don't ask the question of should I expect a lot of overtime? But I do think it's probably good to ask if there's certain times of the year that are busier than others, because that can kind of probably gauge whether or not you would be working overtime. What do you think? Yeah, no, I think that's that's great. And I think, you, you know, if you put yourself as you're sitting there being interviewed and you put yourself in the position of being of, of being the interviewer and the kinds of questions that you're getting, they're going to ask you to tell stories about and give you experiences or, and give your uh, experiences with certain situations. And I feel like the questions that you ask uh can be equally exploratory mm -hmm. so i would avoid yes or no questions that you want to ask but instead like you should i expect a lot of overtime that's a yes or no question right. so i would slash that right yeah. away but i like the idea about can you tell me how you tell me about the general flow of a given calendar year in terms of work expectations what what does it look like in your busiest season versus your quietest and and you know how does the the work change how does the environment change how does the culture change uh anytime you get a chance to uh to get them talking 
talking and telling you a story gives you all that more information to listen to. Absolutely. Well, and you brought up culture. And I think that that's also a good question is, you know, how would you explain the the work culture here and have them explain mm-hmm. that to you? Uh, and why do they like working here? Um, and I would also ask, why is the position open? You know, I mean, I think that's a fair question. Did somebody get promoted? Did somebody leave? Did, you know, Mm -hmm. why is it open? Is it a new position? I don't know. I mean, I I think I'd just be curious to know, especially if it's a new position, because that's something you have to be thinking about, too. They're not exactly sure how this is going to look. So there might be some tweaking along the way. Um, and then I would say, you know, what are the next steps? How, how, when can I expect to hear back from you? Please, please don't say ever, please don't say, when can I start? Oh my oh, yeah, God. No, don't do I that. get it. Like say, and particularly, I, you know, my experience is interviewing for sales and marketing and, and I get this, it never fails from salespeople, a strong handshake. And when would you like me to start or see you Monday? Yeah. And I'm telling you, nothing is a bigger turnoff, right? I, it is, I agree. it's not a great assumptive close in, in this kind of a, a situation. You, you're probably not reading the room. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if 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 that feels like a, the next thing you should say, or if you say it at the end of every be, interview. Be confident, but not arrogant. And at the end of the interview, shake their hand, nice firm handshake, look at them in the eye, thank them for the opportunity, their time, however it comes to you to say something like that, but definitely um, thank them. So tip number seven is about follow-up. And, and when I was talking about this, I was uh, certainly thinking of the ADHD mind. It's really easy to kind of forget about the interview after it's done or forget to follow up. So I would say send a uh, reminder or set a reminder on your phone to follow up maybe about two or three days after the interview. And depending on your initial correspondence, whether it was an email or a text or a phone call, you know, follow up with a thank you. Uh, Let them know you're interested in the position and that you look forward to hearing from them soon. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I hope that whatever company you do interview with, that they do actually respond back to you either way. I think it's really rude when people don't because you're kind of like wondering what happened. Um, You probably won't get a reason why you didn't get the job. So that is something that I would tell you that sometimes we would get questions about why they didn't get it or what happened. And, um, you know, the HR laws, I don't think have changed all that much when it regards in regards to that. They're going to be pretty. Yeah. If anything, they've gotten more conservative. They're in, very in conservative. You're yeah. So. so you're never going to but, find out, you know, from an interviewer. But but I think it's really important if you're seeking for a job to understand this and, and tell me if it's different from your experience. But for me, uh, the experience has always been I am not filtering applicants for reasons they're not going to get the job. So once I've decided that there is a group of folks that is above the line, I'm no longer paying attention at all to why you aren't getting the job. There was something about skill set, fit, whatever, that meant you didn't cross that line. And I just am not thinking about you anymore. Thank you so much. But I am I am filtering for the aspects that I believe as a hiring manager are going to be in alignment with the job. I don't know why you didn't get the job. All I know is you didn't have the thing that they did. And I've moved on. Well, and something with that, too, I think, is that remember that. So this is my philosophy. Some people may not think the same, but I just think that it wasn't meant to be then. I think that there's something higher that, you know, if I didn't get this position, there was something that they saw that they saw that I wouldn't fit. And I don't know what that is. And so that's where you have to just keep your confidence and keep moving and not let that bug you. You know, you can keep practicing. You can keep listening to yourself. You can keep um making your interview skills strong and and just with that RSD really try to let that go you know that okay I didn't get this position but that's okay there's going to be something else that's going to open up so just you know keeping that positive energy is going to really help uh bonus tip Let's talk a little bit about what happens as we live in an online world. What happens when they don't? You're not going to meet them in person. You're not driving over to their place. But they say, hey, let's set up a Zoom. Let's set up a Skype interview and and have our conversation face to face, but through the computer. What do you think about I that? I would do the same thing, really, as you would in person. You know, show up early, be um 
be prepared, have your questions ready. In fact, it's almost better in some respects if they're online because you could even have like, you know, some little notes here in front of you and no one's going to know. So you could have like some little bullet points and little reminders. And um, so I would look at it as a good opportunity. You know, something else that might happen is they may want you to to fill out like a questionnaire or or something like that before too. And and, um, that gives you some time you know, to also kind of look at the questions and be able to respond and not be in a, in a rush. So there's actually a lot of good things about online interviewing. Oh, there are a lot of good things about it. I, I would add, clean up your set, right? Make yeah. sure that what is behind you is straight. Don't be sitting in a pile of uh, things or dirty laundry or your bed. I uh, agree. Make sure you clean up your set, right? right? Look good. Like I would clean up that table. It's got like my wallet, my keys on it and an iPad stand. I would clean that stuff off. Uh, I would also uh, wear pants, you know, <laughs> and I know that sounds like a joke, uh, but I get so many people that say, you know, oh, it's so funny. You can wear pants. It's like the always the first joke that I hear when people say um, you you got to uh, uh, this is so great. I can interview from home or I can work from home. Wear pants because I'm telling you, if you dress 100 percent for the part, you're going to have a better interview. If you're wearing fuzzy slippers and so when I was on the news, like I'm serious, like I was an anchor on the news, believe it or not. And when I was on the news, we used to have this gag where, of course, sometimes you just you'd wear shorts like, you know, khaki shorts or something with your blazer and your thing if you're never going to stand up. But you suck when you do that. Right. You you don't sound the part. You don't live the experience when you're not dressed for the role. So whatever role it is, you want to dress for it because you will exude something different. Uh, wear shoes, for example. Like, it just feels different than when you're doing it bohemian. Uh, so that's that's a that good point. Is, that's a really good. It's point. yeah. It's it's charming and fun and funny. We get this all the time, right? When we're podcasting, and oh, it's great. You can do it from bed. I don't do it from bed. I'm in my office and I stand up and I'm actually engaged in the process. And uh, I think it sounds different as a result. So you know, come to play. Yeah, absolutely, right? absolutely. That's a great point. That's a great point. The only other thing that I didn't put in here that I think is going to be helpful, hopefully, to people is I know that the application process can be Oh, awful. Um, and so, and the resume p- process can be really daunting too. So I would just say, you know, uh, definitely have some people look at your resume, um, double check it, edit it, you know, don't be the only eyes on it. Um, look at format. It has to be easy to read. Um, you don't have to have a lot of information on there. I think it's like, it is, it's really kind of the basis of what you did, the dates, the skills you have, but just make sure it's easy to read. Because when I would go through the resumes, I skimmed them. I never read them word for word. Um, if you have a cover letter, don't have just a standard stupid cover letter. We can tell it's very obvious, especially when you don't change the name and, you know, <laughs> it's to a different company. I always write them in crayon. Yeah. And I make sure I spill a little coffee. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So just be careful. But, you know, I don't even know if they do cover letters anymore. I don't know if that's a thing. There are so many automated systems now when you're applying for jobs, especially when you're applying through agencies. Like you fill in blanks and boxes and everything gets routed now, right? It's just a very different... Experience. I think that the easiest way to to make this easy for you is to just have a document that you can open up that has all of that information and all you have to do is cut and paste and fill in and not have to think about it. So do that preparation, maybe have your resume and that could be it, you know, of what you look at for the online stuff. But that's the biggest key is just having the information ready to go so it doesn't seem so cumbersome when you're actually applying. I have, I have one more tip. Can yeah, I add please. one more bon- bonus tip number 2A? Uh, we have not yet talked specifically about the value of networking, and we, that should oh, go right. without saying, right? Activating your own contacts and friends and relationships and friends, spouses, whatever, when you're looking for a job. Um, I the, the number of experiences that I have had where people have activated my their relationship with me to look for a referral and to look for a positive re- you know, interview, um, where that relationship has been torpedoed 
because they haven't switched modes, right? They come to me, they ask for me for a job, and then they make an off-color joke or something that's just right. You have to assume as soon as you activate your network in a job hunting space that you're already interviewing for a job. It doesn't matter how long you've known the person that you're asking, doesn't matter how often you've been fishing with them or hunting or camping, whatever. You're already, you're saying, hey, Bob, I need your help. I would very much like an in at your company. I think I have the the skills and there's a job open. You have begun interviewing for the position there immediately because if you're asking me, my head is now shifted to, would I actually want to work with this person? I'm great being friends with them, but do I want to see them every day? Right. And then you're being interviewed. It doesn't it doesn't matter the social construct. You have changed the relationship by asking for that favor. And so don't torpedo it by uh, mischaracterizing your friendship for something else. Please, please change that level uh, of interaction. That's a so. really good point. Really good point. All right. There you go. Lots of great stuff That's right. today. Lots Pete. of good stuff. A good continuation nice of our conversation. Uh, please uh, continue the conversation over in Discord or on Facebook. We'd love to hear all of your ideas and your experiences uh, to e- embrace and extend what we have started here in our ADHD and work series. Thank you, everybody. On behalf of Nikki Kinzer, I'm Pete Wright. We'll catch you next time right here on Taking Control, the ADHD podcast. Mm-hmm.